There we are. Now we are recording. I'm going to hit got it, I think. <laughs> yes, I've got it. Um, so it, it is, it's such a great question, of course, and it is uh, entirely subjective. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to respond by going to something I heard secondhand, although I trust it to be true, uh, from Michael Billington, who used to be the, uh, for many years, the lead critic of the Guardian newspaper over in London and a very erudite man. I, I'm particularly fond of, of Michael because he wrote a very controversial article some 20 years ago, the headline of which read Chicago Theater Capital of America. Mm -hmm. uh, he, had a, he had a great affection for a lot of our theaters here, the Goodman, Steppenwolf, Victory Gardens, where I was in residence for many years. But as you can imagine, some of our friends in New York were not too, uh, too happy with that particular evaluation. Uh, but he traveled to Chicago a lot, and and uh, we got to travel to London sometimes and hear from him. He used to say a great play, it, essentially it was the three E's. It had to be engaging, it had to be enlightening, and it had to provide an epiphany. Well, so can we build on that and maybe go into each of those elements? Um, so. You know, what is it that, in your view, makes a play engaging? And can you give an example, maybe even from what you teach about? Sure. Um, so I'm, I'll reference a few plays that actually I've taught recently at the Graham School. Um, and they are, you know, I think of I think of Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman. Um, I think of Lorraine Hansberry's A Raisin in the Sun a particular affection for her because she is a former Chicagoan too. First black uh, woman to be produced on Broadway. And, and that original production of A Raisin in the Sun directed by Lloyd Richards, who was the first black director to direct a show on Broadway. And he was, I, I basically studied under his tutelage for three mm -hmm. summers at the O'Neill National Playwrights Conference. And then I also think I'm gonna bring in a Londoner here, David Hare, who wrote uh, the really excellent play, Plenty. So, you know, I, I think with Death of a Salesman, I find myself, and again, this is completely subjective, but I'm drawn into the story of Willie Lohman because today is the day that he sets out to do what he has been doing for, I guess, 40 years, gets in the car, goes out to sell his wares, stops, can't do it anymore, turns around, comes home. And so there's something very different about today already. That is the event that puts the play into motion. And I am engaged with his struggle as during the last 24 hours of his life, he attempts to ascertain what it's all been about, whether it's been worth it and whether or not he has been chasing the right dream. Um, some might say it's the American dream. Uh, with Lorraine Hansberry's play, this is the day that um, the younger family uh, is getting ready to receive a check. It's a, basically a financial windfall for them, $10,000. And it comes from uh, the patriarch's life insurance policy. And the question becomes, especially for the younger generation, Walter Lee and Benita, what are we to do with this money? Um, in some ways they're asking, what are we to do with our father's legacy? I find that to be compelling and engaging. Um, with David Hare's play, Plenty, such an unusual play produced in the 1970s. And he is, um, he is basically writing uh, over the course of 20 years about uh, a woman's downward spiral uh, that is also mirrored by the collapse of the British Empire. The play begins in the 1940s and ends sometimes in the, in the 1960s. But the opening image of this play is so captivating that I'll stay with this woman for the next two hours, no matter what she does. And that image is, today is the day that she has decided to leave her husband. And she does it in the most spectacular way possible. She has emptied the house of all furniture and she has drugged her husband and disrobed him so lights come up, there's a naked man, unconscious on stage. And there is our central character, Susan Traherne, fully clothed, standing over him, smoking a cigarette. Well, who wouldn't wanna go on that adventure? 
So those are those are three examples of plays that I find to be tremendously engaging, and and the reason they are engaging. You know, I, I guess if we want to get simple about it, we could say, engaging is another way of saying entertaining. And you know, we look at Death of a Salesman. Are there a lot of laughs in Death of a Salesman? Well, you know, he says Miller says he was laughing the whole time he wrote it. So there actually are some laughs, um, although it's not a comedy, but it is in its own way, wildly entertaining, I think, and wildly engaging. When I think you're also speaking, Douglas, to the connection to the human experience, right? You see yourself in some of these characters or at least imaginations that you've had about yourself. And you also have this extraordinary nature. So this is a different day than every day for the past four years this is obviously a very extraordinary example. And the other that you mentioned that, you know, there is this very um, irregular, you know, human uh, relationship. And so there's a way in which it's connecting to you and it's in some ways um, challenging your assumptions uh, that, that you begin to kind of engage around. Um, I, I want to jump into the next piece of this. And I know these three E's are likely connected because it's hard to enlighten unless someone is already engaged in the material. Uh, so, you know, it feels like the next natural step to say, you know, how can a playwright bring enlightenment into a play? And, you know, just as a person who sits as a dean of a school that has a lot of enlightenment goals, I'm curious what you would say is different about the enlightenment you can achieve through a play than through other forms of education. Great. So uh, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll go back to David Hare's play, Plenty. Um, he was inspired to write this play after he read a statistic. And that statistic was that 75% of the women who served in the SOE, they were essentially special agents during the Second World War, came home and divorced their husbands. So that's, that's a fact. And that is something that you could probably write an essay about. But instead of writing an essay, he wrote a play. <laughs> To, to dramatize why that might be. Um, and that's, but that, that particular statistic is not cited inside his play, but it's all over his play. So he's getting to the thing that he wants to enlighten his audience about, or perhaps even educate them about, but he's doing it uh, in a way that is not didactic. Um, in terms of what's different uh, about the theater, how we can educate in a way that is different. Well, we've of course, we've got to be engaging. We've got to be entertaining. And if we do it right, we can subvert the play. I say this a lot about mysteries and thrillers because I write a lot of mysteries and thrillers that if, if you tell the story, if you tell a good story, you can subvert that form to your own serious ends, your own serious uh, political ends or social ends or sometimes religious ends. You can say anything you want so long as you uh, are not spoon feeding your audience the information. So I feel like if, if the play presents a great argument, let's say Jean Anouy's Antigone, you wanna hear from both sides of the argument. And in a way you wanna be able to agree with Creon as much as you agree with Antigone. Well, so there's one more E and then I promise to get into other questions, but I just wanna follow this train of thought epiphany. And that feels, I mean, on first glance to be the hardest of the three, right? Because you actually need to bring someone to an observation they didn't expect to have. Um, talk about how you see playwrights approach that and examples that you may see in some of the plays that you teach. Sure. So again, hearkening back to Plenty, I think the central character of that, Susan, her epiphany is that there's only one kind of dignity. And this is a very perhaps despairing point of view, but for her, it's in living alone. That's finally what she comes to. Um, Willie Lohman in Death of a Salesman comes to understand that he is actually worth more dead than alive. He has an epiphany about that by the end of the play, which of course leads to tragic results. On a more positive note, um, and there was always a conversation about this and it, with a raisin in the sun. Is it Mama's play or is it Walter Lee's play? Um, many people believe it is Walter Lee's play because he's the character who goes through the greatest transformation. And his transformation, his 
moment of reckoning comes when he is forced to make a decision and become a man in front of his son. And it's his mother who challenges him to make that decision. So it's, it's, a, it's an epiphany for him and hopefully for those of us who have taken this journey with him in that very great play, it can be an epiphany for us as well. Well, so we titled this conversation with you, The Power of Play Writing. Uh, we've talked about the power of plays and what makes a great play, uh, but I wanna now move into the other domain that you teach. You, you teach playwrights uh, and you go through their plays. You also teach playwriting and how people can learn to pen uh, these great plays. And so I'm curious to kind of jump over to the playwriting side and ask, you know, what's different about playwriting than other forms of writing? And, you know, in your view, what are the keys to successful playwriting? Well, two very big questions. Uh, let me start with the first, which is one of the things that separates, and it's fascinating actually, because one of my students in my current class asked me this very question two weeks ago, and I had to answer on the spot. So now I've had time to, to consider it a little more carefully. But if you're writing um, a piece of prose or poetry, um, and you are, you are, let's say you're the, the recipient of that prose or poetry, you're the reader, you get to stop and say, savor a paragraph or a verse. You can put the book aside. You can have a very personal relationship with that book, but it's, you are with the writer. You are with the author. It's one-on-one. -on -one. If you are watching film or TV, um, you know, with television now, of course, we can stop and go. Uh, we're watching Netflix and we want to get up and get a drink of water. So we pause the film or we're hungry and we go get ourselves a meal and maybe we don't come back to the film, but we finish it another day or maybe we never finish it. Uh, if you go and see a film, let's say you, you go and see the new James Bond and you, you love it and you want to go back and see it again. Well, that film is going to be exactly the same the next time you see it. The theater, and this is what's very different about it, is ephemeral. It's here and then it's not. And it requires, it absolutely requires that the audience be in the room. You can run a film without an audience in the room. I'm sure we've all had, you know, sometimes we've probably all been to a movie where we're the only person there. And if we weren't there, they would still run the film. If there's nobody in the house that night, they're not gonna do the play. The play depends upon the active participation of people living together with the actors who are on the stage. Theater is also, it's relentless. It just keeps moving. It doesn't stop for you. You have to keep up with it. It's bodies moving through space. It's three dimensions. And you know, I, I think about Stephen Sondheim on this because he talks about how the lyric has to be so concise with his songs because audiences only get to hear it once. You only get to experience that play once. You can go back and see it again another night, but it's gonna be a different play. The audience is gonna be different. If there's laughs, they may be in a different place. The actors may be feeling something different. So that's one of the things that separates the theater from any other popular uh, medium. Um, in terms of, gosh, what was the second question? Was it about- Yeah, so I mean, it's a perfect segue. What does that mean for writing a play. I mean, so as you think about the different context in which this writing is uh, performed and, and brought to its audience, you know, and you were already going into this with, with Sondheim, you know, what are the keys to successful playwriting? It sounds like Sondheim is saying one key is, you know, short verses that are easy to understand because unlike poetry where, you know, perhaps someone can keep reading it again and again at their own pace, right? This is um, not something that you rewind and, and play again. Um, yeah, what are other examples of what makes successful playwriting based on that, you know, unique dimension of what makes plays different from other forms? Well, I, I think for me, it, in order to write a full-length play, you need to learn how to write a one-act or it behooves you to learn how to write a one act play. In order to write a one act, it's good to learn how to write a good, short, sharp, 10 minute scene. So right now I've set up this playwriting program uh, at the Graham School, where in the fall people can take introduction to playwriting. And then in the winter, writing the 10 minute play, 
uh, in the spring, uh, writing the one act play, and then in the summer, hopefully developing a play in progress where people can work on full lengths or a one act or a collection of short plays. One of the things that I always talk to my students about is trying to ascertain or identify what it is their characters want. What do they need? What must they have? What is the central conflict of the play? Once you've identified what it is the central character wants, what's keeping them from getting it? Um, and, and more importantly, if they can't get it, what happens? And also if they can, if they do get it, what happens then as well? So I think to, to, to think about your people uh, in terms of their appetites, because we all have appetites and intensify those because that's what theater is. Theater is life without the boring parts. So one of the, one of the ways that we, can, <laughs> that we can get our audience to engage with our plays is make sure that we're not boring the audience. Um, I also think it's important, and, I, and I, I find this a lot, I think in the theater, this is true of other mediums as well, it's film and TV, perhaps in prose as well, but I think in the theater within a very short period of time, audiences want to know, where am I, who am I with, why should I care? And the question that I find that a lot of uh, writers um, can't answer as successfully as they might is why should I care? It may be something that interesting that happened to them, but of course, just because it happened to you doesn't make it interesting. You need to identify that want, that need, that must have in your character in order to compel your audience to spend time with them. Also, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna quote Samuel Beckett here. In order to be, a, well, in order to be good at anything, it's not just the theater, but he said, fail, fail again, fail better. Um, I was back in college writing plays and I'd written a lot of plays and I'd had some of them produced and I had a very close friend say to me one day, you know, I think Doug, someday you may be good. And I really <laughs> thought I was good, you know, I had no idea. And I, and so, but I, I did ask him, I said, so what do you mean by that? He goes, because you're not afraid to be bad. And that's pivotal. You have to be fearless. You have to allow yourself to be bad before you can achieve before you can even approach mediocrity. And then once, you, once you've established that, maybe you can go on to goodness or greatness. Well, so I have some more questions for you, Douglas, but I'm gonna start some of our audience questions because they are now streaming in. And let me just encourage anyone who hasn't seen the chat yet that you are also invited to chat in your questions. Uh, Dennis Callanan asks, can you talk about stop words, Arcadia? Uh, in terms of the three E's. And I don't know if that's a play that you're familiar with, but I'm guessing Tom Stoppard is in the lexicon far, far enough that, that you may be. So um, how would you look at that play in terms of the three E's? Yeah, I'm already thinking about the epiphany because we, I actually taught a, a, a course on Stoppard um, last winter. And I think the very last play we investigated was Arcadia. And I learned honestly uh, as much from my students uh, as I did from reading up on the play before we got into the virtual room together. I think it's wildly entertaining. He's always wildly entertaining and engaging because he's such a smart man and I'm always racing to keep up with him and he's clever and he's funny. And there is a deep dive into history that's taking place. There's two stories that are moving forward at once in two different time periods. And I find myself engaged in both of those stories as I try to put the puzzle together to try to figure out what is this man up to. Um, in terms of enlightenment, I mean, it's all over his work. It's not just Arcadia, but he, he's, he will spend four years writing a play. And then at some point he has to stop because the research is just overwhelming and he has to pull himself away. And so much of his research, so much of what he has learned and he is excited about is in his plays. But again, he's presenting it all in the most entertaining way possible. The epiphany for me is that last scene when finally the characters from the past and the present come together in this marvelous dance. And uh, it is, it's chilling and it's emotional. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I get choked up just thinking about it. So that's how I'd answer that. Wonderful, thank you. Um, let me follow up with a question about the moment that we're in. Uh, so someone uh, privately chatted me that they are curious kind of how the pandemic has impacted 
plays not just obviously in this moment, right, which is it shut down Broadway for 18 months and it took away uh, that live uh, structure that you, you know, described as core uh, to what it means, uh, but also how it might even shape, you know, plays as we look to the future. Now, you know, we have almost, um, you know, an opportunity slash challenge potentially by the fact that some plays are now, you know, um, recorded by Disney and, and then presented, you know, in, um, in television. How do you see that all impacting? What are the, you know, kind of positives potentially of the changes that are coming? And what do you see as some of the risks as you look to the future? Yes, of course. It, and it's, it's um, well, it's a fascinating question. And it's hard to answer because we're in the middle of it. So we don't really know what we're doing. Um, but we're learning as we go. Um, and I'm a very active member of the Dramatist Guild. And a year ago, you know, they had to come up with a separate contract because of all the virtual work that was going on. Um, and there's two sides to this conversation. I tend to believe that virtual theater uh, is not necessarily theater uh, because it lacks that live component. I think it is somewhere between film and TV and the live experience. But, you know, for example, if you, if you watch Hamilton, Lin-Manuel Miranda's very great um, hip hop opera, um, there's, something, there's something great about watching that on a big or a small screen, but it's not the same as being in the room where it happens. So I think <laughs> we're all struggling with this and we're trying to figure it out but uh, I, for one, um, cannot wait to get uh, uh, back into uh, a live theater. I have not done so yet. I've been out to hear some concerts. We visited some museums, but my wife and I are traveling to New York uh, next month. We're seeing three shows. I'm not gonna tell you what they are, but uh, we're, <laughs> we're, you know, we'll, we're vaccinated and we'll wear our masks and we will be there to, uh, to witness whatever the actors can bring to the occasion. Wonderful. Well, I have a number of other questions here that we'll get to. We're going to start, Calvin Wichard, with your question. I'm new at this, but should a playwright be an actor, have some acting under their belt to better understand the writing of a play? So how do you think about that relationship? You do notice at times that sometimes there is, but I don't know if that's always the case. And how do you see the benefits of that potential connection? Yes. Well, I think there's a great benefit to um, studying acting. I was a student of acting myself for 10 years. Um, please notice I, I do not say that I was an actor. Um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a very, very large difference. Um, and I enjoyed it tremendously because I got to investigate plays from the inside out. I learned a lot during that time. Um, and there's, there is just, there's almost no comparison. I mean, it, it is probably the very best way to understand how a play has been put together. However, when I think of the three people I just listed at the start of this class, Arthur Miller, Lorraine Hansberry, David Hare, I don't think they were actors. I think David Hare was a director who just started writing plays in the back of his van. Um, Lorraine Hansberry studied uh, art, I believe. Arthur Miller went away to, to college and you know, he was a terrible student at everything but playwriting. So he kind of fell into it. Uh, and you know, he gives, I think he gives hope to terrible students everywhere um, because he found his calling. But I, I think it's, I, I, and this is, what I, this is what I find is that there seems to be two ways that people approach the theater. They can come at it from a literary perspective or they can come at it from a theatrical perspective. I think it's great if you can come at it from a theatrical perspective, but that does not negate the fact that some very, very great writers have come at it from a literary perspective. Um, somebody like Tom Stoppard is the perfect example because he, he, was, a, he was a critic for, for gosh sakes, you know, and he attended a lot of plays. So that's how he learned about the theater, um, but he was not an actor and I don't think he's ever had any ambitions to be an actor. Timothy Ray asks, do you agree that in Western playwriting, the Aristotelian format works best, beginning, middle, end, traditional dramatic arc, act structures, or do you see other alternatives? I see many other alternatives. Um, 
uh, David Harris play Plenty is the scene that takes place over 20 years. It's 12 scenes and he has shuffled up the order of those scenes so that he plays fast and loose with time. And it, you, could, you could rearrange that play so that it happens in correct chronological order, but it would not be the same play and it would not be as good. A play that really crept up on me recently, and I don't know why it took me so long to figure this one out, is Carol Churchill's Top Girls, which is so unlike Aristotle as to you know, be a, a completely different language. Um, and yet it works. And I don't think anybody structurally was doing what she was doing at the time. Um, that being said, we will never be able to escape the well-made play. And I think the well-made play is wonderful. I've written some myself. I do think there's something to this unity of time and place and action, but it doesn't mean that all plays need to follow that form. And you know, um, you, you've got to let the content dictate the form. So sometimes the, malay, the play may come to you in such a way that doesn't fit what Mr. Aristotle has to say. <laughs> so you gotta figure it out for yourself. Well, a real challenge to the many basic program grads that are on here who have read their Aristotle well. Uh, Margaret Kane asks, how do we know if the play itself is good or if the actor is exceptional? I'm thinking of Timothy Edward Kane's An Iliad. Yeah, which I didn't get to see, but I've heard great things about it. I think I understand the question. Um, sometimes a very great actor can uh, make uh, a not very good play sound better than it is. Uh, that has been my experience in the theater. Um, however, sometimes, you know, I find myself, I think I've written something that's worthy. And um, I, I find myself occasionally in, in I, I've worked with a lot of really good actors and I don't want to belittle what the actor does, but occasionally you can just feel, oh, I've got an actor here who really doesn't get it. They may not understand the rhythms of how I'm writing or they may not understand exactly what this play is about. Um, so how do we get them to where they need to go so that the play can come across? But there's no chance for the play to be successful, really, unless the director, the designers, and the actors are all top notch. Kimberly Marinenko, um, and I apologize, Marinkoff um, asks, what have been influences for developing the skill to write effective dialogue? So as you think about what's influenced you, are there some role models out there that have really shaped your way of writing and your vision for your own genre. Yeah, I'm I'm very lucky because um, I got to live overseas outside of London as a boy for three years. Uh, my family traveled over there when I was eight, and we came back when I was eleven. And at that point in time, even though we lived thirty miles outside of the city, it was cheaper for my parents to take me to the theater than it was to hire a babysitter. <laughs> so I got to see everything, you know, I got to see um, mysteries and pantomimes and political dramas and sex comedies. I got to see Shakespeare. I got to see musicals. Um, I got to hear a little bit of everything. And I've, I found that, that when I really started to investigate plays, more than anyone else, um, it, was, it was the Brits who stayed with me. It was people like... Um, Harold Pinter and Tom Stoppard and David Hare and Carol Churchill and Howard Brenton and more recently Lucy Kirkwood, wonderful, wonderful writer who were doing things with language that I had not heard done before. And so the trick is how do I, how do, as an American, um, how do I incorporate that into my own writing without sounding like an Anglophile? Um, and so that's, that's probably those have been the strongest influences on my own work. So I have one more question here uh, from Tamana Ferdis, and she mentions that there are screenwriting courses that value Dan Harmon's story circle, which is a reference that you might be familiar with. And she's wondering how that idea of story circle is related to the idea of a one act play or a 10 minute play. 
I'm not familiar with what a story circle is, so I would simply be making this up. <laughs> well, then, can I ask the follow-up question, which is, can you talk more about the rise of the 10-minute play? Uh, because I know one of the other reasons that you've added it to our Graham School courses is that it's a really useful way to start. It's also, I think you mentioned, a rising form of art that there are 10 minute play festivals around the country. And so I'm just curious uh, if you could share kind of why the rise of this version. Is it a reflection, for example, of the fact that now everything is aimed to be in shorter formats in this kind of social mediaized world? Yeah, it's a, that's a great question, Seth. Yes, there are there are 10 minute play festivals happening everywhere. You cannot throw uh, a stick without hitting one. They are ubiquitous. Um, and I think by and large, that's a good thing because I like the idea that a producer can take a chance on say nine playwrights that he or she may never have heard of and put them together in an evening and uh, sample their wares. And I think the great thing for an audience, of course, is like, if you don't like this play, just wait nine minutes, there'll be another one. <laughs> um, I, I think that uh, the other thing that's really interesting about the form is that it is not, I, even though it's become so popular in the last 10 to 20 years, um, some of our very greatest playwrights have worked in this form in the past. Maria Irene Fornes wrote a wonderful 10 minute play that I reference all the time called Drowning. Harold Pinter wrote it, uh, he just called it a sketch uh, uh, he wrote a number of short plays, but I, I always reference Knight. Um, August Wilson wrote 10 minute plays. So, oh, and this one I love, George Bernard Shaw's very last play was 10 minutes in length. Wow. Now, now it was a puppet play. <laughs> it has since that time been performed by live actors. So it's a form that uh, I think a lot of playwrights, uh, specifically through the 20th century, latter half of the 20th century, now into the 20th first century, have dabbled in. And it's, it's, a, it's a great way, of course, to learn about writing. And it's, it's, um, you know, it's great to be in the company of other writers. So that's the other thing about 10 minute play festivals. If you, get a, if you get a work submitted, you will learn as much about your own play as you will about everybody else's in the room. Well, so we have talked about a lot of great plays uh, that other people have written and you've shared your tips. I want to just take a moment and talk about your plays because you are an award-winning and global playwright. Uh, can you share one play that has particular significance to you and give us a snapshot of the plot line? Sure. Um, I'll try. Uh, I, I, you know, this was a while back. I was commissioned by a, a British playwright uh, named Simon Slater to write a one-man show for him. And this was the assignment. He, he wanted me to create a work that would showcase his abilities as an actor, as a singer, as a musician, and as a magician. <laughs> and I, I knew Simon uh, because he and I had worked together and we'd become pals and he was frequently coming in and out of Chicago, sometimes for personal reasons, sometimes for professional. And I just kept thinking, he's such a talented guy. I wish somebody would write something for him that was just for him. And then he comes to me with this idea. And of course, I leapt at it. Um, and I ended up writing uh, a one man thriller because I thought nobody's ever done a one man thriller. Have they successfully? And you know, I want to try to figure out why that is. The piece was called Bloodshot. We put it up uh, at the Nuffield Theater in Southampton under the direction of our friend, Patrick Sanford. Uh, he and Simon had worked together on a number of plays and Patrick had previously directed two of my plays in Southampton. So it was old home week when we finally got together in the rehearsal room. Um, it was well enough received that it was uh, remounted the following year in Southampton. And then we took it to Newberry and then to Winchester. And it played for six weeks in Vienna. It came back to the UK and it, and it played Greenwich and Kent. And then we finally got it in to London. And for me, that was, uh, uh, that was a real achievement, especially because the play is set in 1957 in London. And it absolutely could not sound like a guy from Chicago had written it. <laughs> so I, I seem to be able to fool the Londoners and I seem to be able to fool the national press 
um, one or two of whom you know, were aware of where I had come from and said, there's nothing in this play that would make you think that this man was not a native of London. Um, and my wife, you know, came over to see it. She had not seen the play before. She is, she is very forthright and she's gonna tell me if it works or if it doesn't work. But she said watching Bloodshot for her and watching the work of my colleagues, Simon and Patrick, it was witnessing three men operating together at the top of their craft. So that was a good day. Well, a great day. And um, can you give us, because we're coming up to the end of time, the 60 second version of the plot line. So it sounds like it's 1950s London. Um, is there a way to kind of high level, you know, what's happening in that story? Yes, without giving too much away. It's, it, 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 it circles in and around a photographer named Derek Evely, who uh, in the, is, is a man who in the past has had a drinking problem uh, when he actually was a police officer, but he's quit all that. He used to be a crime scene photographer and he's become artistic, if you will, but the work has dried up. And one day a letter alive, arrives through his mail slot. Uh, it's surreptitiously, he is uh, asked, hired, to wander the streets of London following um, a young immigrant woman from the West Indies and commit her likeness to film. And so he does this. And uh, without realizing it, he falls in love with the subject of his photographs. And one day he witnesses her murder. And so he undertakes an investigation to determine who she was and what has happened to her. Oh, well, that sounds engaging, enlightening, and as if it may have an epiphany. Uh, so I just want to share that this conversation with you had all of those elements as well. Uh, Douglas, thank you so much for your time. And even more, thank you for being a Graham School instructor. I am truly in awe of the people that choose to teach with us, and you are an extraordinary example. Um, I have learned so much from you in our other conversations as well as this one, and uh, truly, I feel like you've given us all an even greater understanding and appreciation for plays and theater and have helped us to see how the science behind uh, this, this great art uh, actually operates. Um, thank you all for joining us for this conversation and looking forward to seeing you again at Conversations for Graham. Bye, everyone.